Hello, everyone. I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Rohit Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. The year of 2023 has been to a great start in oncology as we have seen five new drugs or indications approved by the FDA already in the month of January. This means we have more treatment options for our patients, but also more data for us as a community oncologist to keep up with to help us better understand one of these approvals and its place in our current treatment. We have Dr. Aditya Bardia from Mass General Hospital, Harvard School of Medicine, who is an author of the Emerald Trial, which has led to the approval of alicestrant in metastatic breast cancer. Cannot wait to learn more about this, so let us get started. Dr. Bardia, thank you so much for joining us today. And absolutely, thank you so much for the invitation. And I'm excited to be here today. I'm Adit Tibori, a breast medical oncologist at Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, part of Harvard Cancer Center. So excited about the discussion today. Dr. Bordia, congratulations on your recent work and approval. To start, can you please tell us a little about Alcestrant as an agent and study designed for Emerald study? Yeah, no, absolutely. So the mainstay of management of hormone receptor positive breast cancer, including metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer, is endocrine therapy. Endocrine therapy is the mainstay of management of ER positive disease, but patients eventually have disease progression, and there's been a need for better endocrine agents. Usually in the second, third line setting, we tend to use fulvestrant, which is an intramuscular selective estrogen receptor degrader. And the problem is in the post CDK4-6 setting, because we tend to use CDK4-6 plus endocrine therapy as first line, in the second, third line setting with fulvestrant alone, the median progression-free survival is usually in the range of two, two and a half months, three months. So it's not a very effective agent. Plus from a patient perspective, it tends to cause inconvenience because it's given as an intramuscular shot. So from a field perspective, there's been interest in novel endocrine agents that are oral, and that would be better than fulvestrant. And that's where elacestrant comes in. The estrant is because it's a selective estrogen receptor degrader. And elacestrant is an oral agent which has demonstrated clinical activity. It was first seen in the phase one, phase two trial where it had shown uh, efficacy even in patients who had received prior fulvestrant. And you could see a signal in a subset of ER positive metastatic breast cancer. Uh, particularly tumors that harbor the so-called ESR1 mutations. So two points related to this. The first is that ESR1 mutations are acquired alterations in the estrogen receptor that make the tumor estrogen independent. So you can have the best aromatase inhibitor in the world. It's not going to work because the tumor is estrogen independent. But drugs that directly bind to the estrogen receptor would still work in the in this situation because ESR1 mutant still has the estrogen receptor intact. So drugs like inacestrant would work in that setting. And the second point is that because it's an acquired alteration, if you genotype the primary tumor, it's unlikely that you would see it. It's usually discovered by doing plasma-based genotyping at the time of disease progression. So it is something that does require serial genotyping to pick these alterations up because these are acquired alterations. Now, in terms of the Emerald trial, this was designed to look at this novel selective estrogen receptor degrader in assessment versus investigated choice of endocrine therapy in the second, third line setting. So these were patients who had received prior endocrine plus CDK4-6 inhibitor, usually as first line, and then after that, when they had disease progression, randomization to elacestrant or investigated choice of endocrine therapy, which was largely fulvestrant in this trial. This trial had two primary endpoints and was powered for both of these endpoints. One was looking at progression-free survival in patients who had ESR1 mutant metastatic breast cancer. And the ESR1 mutation was detected based on plasma-based genotyping by the GARDEN360 assay. And the second primary endpoint was looking at the activity or PFS in all comers, which included both ESR1 mutant as well as ESR1 non-detectable uh, population. 
The secondary endpoints were overall survival as well as safety tolerability. Thank you, Dr. Bardia. You brought up the ESR1 mutation. How common is this mutation? And you said that we require zero NGS for this. In your practice, when do you plan to test these patients? Yeah, both good questions. In terms of the frequency, in the second line setting, it's usually around 30% of ER positive breast cancers. But because this is an acquired alteration, the frequency increases over time and up to 50% of ER positive breast cancers oh, wow. could have ESR1 mutations. It's just you have to do serial genotyping to detect this. So if you don't look for it, you're not going to find it. In terms of when plasma-based genotyping should be done, at least in our practice, we tend to do it at the time of disease progression on first-line therapy. And previously, the reason to do genotyping was to identify PIC3C mutations because now we have a drug, Alpelisib, that's FDA-approved in the second and plus-line setting. So it was important to know whether the tumor had PIC3C mutation or not so you could use Alpelisib. But now you could probably do plasma-based genotyping, look for both ESR1 and PIC3CA because both are actionable. Perfect. Thanks for mentioning that. And when you mentioned plasma-based testing, is that what we can completely rely on? Or we have to sometimes chase the tissue biopsy for this as well on progression. And also for the trial, you mentioned that you utilize GARDEN360. Would you recommend just utilizing that or other commercial partners can be utilized for testing for ESR1 mutation? Yeah, good question. For ESR1 mutation in general, one would recommend plasma-based genotyping because it's in the acquired setting. It'll be tough to do tissue biopsies and there could be some heterogeneity and you might miss it. So I would in general rely on plasma-based genotyping. In terms of the assay, I think, you know, Garden360 was used in Emerald, and that's one of the companion diagnostics that's approved by the FDA. But there are other commercial vendors as well. As long as you can rely on the results and you're confident that they are looking at ESR1 mutation with good analytical validity, I would feel comfortable. Okay, thank you. And while we are on this topic, it is important to point out that there were different types of ESR1 mutations present. Dr. Bardia, does the type of mutation matter with these newer agents? Yeah, good question. It's not something we have looked at in Emerald in terms of the type of ESR1 mutation, but in the future, I think that would be important to consider as well. Um, there is some preclinical data that the type of mutation might matter in terms of conferring resistance to both aromatase inhibitor and also uh, fulvestrant. There's a variant called Y537S. That in particular appears to be a very resistant mutation. So we'll need additional data to look at the type of ESR1 mutation and impact on outcomes. But at this time, in as per the FDA label, you could pretty much use it uh, with any ESR1 mutation. Thank you. Dr. Bardia, so what did this study show? So the study met its primary endpoint. It showed that patients who received elacestrant had a superior progression-free survival as compared to those who receive standard endocrine therapy. If you look at the curves, there are three interesting observations. The first is that there's a drop in the curves and then separation. And this initial drop in the curves in both arms likely represents endocrine-resistant disease. This is the second third-line setting. So there will be a subset of population who have endocrine-resistant disease, and you can have the best endocrine agent. It's not going to work, particularly as monotherapy, because the tumor is endocrine-resistant or not dependent on ER. And that's what we are seeing initially with this drop. And that's consistent across many studies. The second observation is looking at median PFS alone can be misleading, and that's why PFS rate at 6 and 12 months is a better metric because of this initial drop and separation, because then you can really capture the efficacy of an agent. And if you look at PFS rate at 12 months, you clearly see a signal between elacestrant and standard of care endocrine therapy. And the third point is that the results are particularly remarkable in mutant ESR1 subgroup. In that population, you see a clear separation of the curve. And if you do subgroup analysis, you see that all the patients, the results are predominantly driven by the mutant ESR1 subgroups. If you look at the ESR1 wild type, 
the results are not as impressive as that of the mutant ESR1. So that's why the FDA approved elacestrant specifically for the mutant ESR1 subgroup. Dr. Bardia, and more recently at San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, you also presented with uh, these patients being on CDK4-6 inhibitors for a certain period of time, and that being a surrogate marker. Can you talk a little more about how that was used and what the update showed? You know, that's a very good point. So uh, um, in the first point I mentioned was that you see an initial drop in the curve and then separation. The question is, can we identify the patients who have this drop versus separation? And we looked at genomics and we really couldn't find a marker that could predict this is a group that's going to have progression versus not. But because all the patients in Emerald had received prior CDK4-6 inhibitor, we looked at the duration of prior CDK4-6 inhibitor as a surrogate marker for endocrine sensitivity. The hypothesis was that if a patient is on CDK4-6 inhibitor for a long period of time, uh, 12, uh, 12 or more months, that would suggest an endocrine sensitive population as opposed to if someone has progression within the first 12 months. And that's exactly what was seen. In patients who had received CDK4-6 inhibitor for more than 12 months, you had a median PFS of close to eight months with elacestrant, so a clear improvement as opposed to about two to three months with standard endocrine therapy. So maybe in clinical practice, that could be a surrogate marker for identifying patients who have endocrine-sensitive disease. Thank you. Dr. Bardia, in the community, after first-line progression, single-agent fulvestrin is not the most common used regimen. We often go to alpha to what you were saying before, or Everlimus, or even chemotherapy in selected patients. So as we wait uh, for Elevate study, who would be an ideal patient that you would consider elacestrin for as a single agent right now? You know, that's a very good question, and you're exactly right. The Elevate study is looking at combinations. So this study provided scientific proof of principle that elacestrin is better than standard endocrine agent, but combinations, you know, would be of interest. The advantage with combination is we likely see better efficacy results. The downside is potential toxicity. When you add agents, you also add to the toxicity. In terms of an ideal patient, I think it would be a patient, as per FDA label, a patient who has ESR1 mutant hormone receptor positive breast cancer, and you feel that likely would have endocrine sensitive disease. So prior CDK4-6 duration of more than 12 or even 18 months, patients with bone metastases, or patients you're concerned that combination therapy could be difficult, patient is not a candidate for alpelacid, I think all of those considerations, both efficacy and toxicity considerations, would come into picture. Thank you. And actually going back to the CDK4-6 inhibitor uh, conversation for a second, when we're looking at all the population, though the benefit is more so with ESR1 mutant, and that's where the approval is, if a patient's been on CDK4-6 inhibitor for, let's say, more than 12 months, and now has progression, outside clinical trial, would you consider elacestrin in that patient that's not ESR1 mutated? And that would be off-label use because the on-label use is for ESR1 mutant Absolutely. setting. Uh, and if you look at the uh, results in all patients, a large part of it was driven by ESR1 mutation. Okay. So I would strongly consider the Elevate trial for that patient because I think elacestrant is a great agent in terms of endocrine therapy, but in the second, third line setting, if you have combination that the patient can tolerate, that would be of interest. Excellent. Thank you. Now, advancing this course further, if we have a patient population now heavily pretreated and has never been exposed to elacestrant in past, now if they have ESR1 mutation and are progressing on current chemo agents, would you consider going back to endocrine therapy with LSSRIN for those patients? Absolutely, absolutely. And as per the FDA label, it's at least one prior line of endocrine therapy. There's no upper limit. So I would definitely consider LSSRIN for a patient with ESR1 mutation in later lines. Thank you, Dr. Bardia. Dr. Bardia, can you please walk us through some of the common side effects with LSSRIN and a few tricks to manage them? In general, it's very well tolerated. It's an oral agent. The rate of discontinuation was very low in the Emerald trial. Um, nausea can be seen. That was the number one side effect. But usually it's not 
uh, chemo nausea that you need anti nausea medications. Uh, most patients don't need any anti nausea medication. It's an oral pill, so that's why they have some discomfort. But you could certainly use uh, Compazine or even on the Cetron if needed for nausea, although in my practice, in general, patients don't need that. Other than that, it's very well tolerated. Looking at emerald, there was also a signal of increase in cholesterol and triglycerides, and that could just be because patients were doing better. So, you know, they live longer and maybe, you know, based on the diet and other things, the cholesterol increased. So that's something you can certainly monitor in this setting. What a great news for all patient population. To sum up, as Rahul mentioned in the beginning, in the community, we need to know when and how to use these new novel agents. The duration of CDK4-6 inhibitor and, in fact, ESR1 mutation can help us select the right patient population for l Dr. Bardia, congratulations again, and thank you so much for walking us through the study and establishing a new treatment option for our patients. And absolutely, thank you for having me. Great discussion.